It's supposed to be the first introduction, visual introduction, to a new subject, a new movie, a new title. Because that's what the posters are supposed to do, is reach people emotionally in their hearts and excite them, inspire them, so that let's go see what this movie's about. It's supposed to promise something, and sometimes that was the pivotal nature of the creative thinking. How do you give somebody something that they understand, but it's something they've never seen before? When I started working on Blade Runner, my first impressions were brought out as sketches just after seeing the film. We had all come to meet and know Harrison Ford. Here he was in this, this very different film, a very different role, and he gets beat up by replicants every 15 minutes, and, and yet he still has to give, be given a heroic status, at least from an advertising point of view. So I finally came about this image of Harrison Ford you know, holding the gun. Gritty, sweaty, a little bit film noir. I mean, even right down to the sort of Venetian blind lighting we were looking for there. I did the illustration for it, became the poster, and became part of one of the, the, the greater years for me in the film industry. Then the poster was still a very viable form of promotion and advertising for a film. Sometimes it was the first glimpse, the first idea that, that someone going to a theater had. Now, while it's still important, it no longer provides that primary form of advertising. So the function of the poster has changed, and in the process, the acceptance or rejection by the public of the poster has changed. Well, sometimes in the development of something like Blade Runner, the reference material was not necessarily terribly available. We ended up with Harrison Ford having a wonderful attitude, but no really good photograph of him doing that. I was able to acquire a frame of film, smaller than an eight by 10, a little black and white, very rough, film grain, but I could pretty much see everything I needed to see, and that was the basis of reference for Harrison Ford. Now, I had my wife shoot a picture of my two hands holding a, a, a mock gun, and that was my reference material to begin painting. Now, the, 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 the Douglas Trumbull miniatures and special effects for the city and for features, there were plentiful photographs of that. And I was able to get enough together to kind of make a, a composite view of the city as, as we saw it in the film. There were some great pictures of Sean Young smoking a cigarette. With the reference I had for Harrison Ford, I felt it was best to finish his face in oil. I was able to capture the likeness, the grittiness that was there turn it in and everybody was happy. In the 80s, and I would say before that in the 70s, and even on into the 90s, the international release of a film was kind of the, it was the bastard child of the whole film industry. I think it was before anybody realized what a great worldwide market there really is. Right now, the video market is kind of doing what the international market did some years back. And that is, they're justifying their own graphic existence. and instead of staying with a branding kind of look, so something's the same, they'll justify their own existence by creating entirely new work for a product that is familiar that they want people to respond to, and they'll market it quite separately. I'm not sure what that's all about, because I'm still a believer, and maybe this is very old school, the thing should look and feel the same from the very first you encounter it to the very last you remember it. All I've really ever been able to do is paint and draw. What I do is I, I come up with concepts or designs, approaches and, and pictorial explanations about what I feel about the film. And I'll do drawings. Just little, sometimes they're little sketches this big, and other times they're larger, more designed, more finished. And sometimes I'll do one drawing, and I've done as many as 60 drawings until the committees decide what they like. And it's usually not, I like that one. It's, I like this from here and that from there and that from there. And once they get that to where they like it, they ask me to do the finished painting. And that takes, you know, a couple of weeks to paint. And uh, what comes of it is all the things that everybody else sees. It winds up on the side of buildings and on billboards and movie posters and t-shirts. And it, it gets a life of its own. And like in the case of Blade Runner, it just goes on and on and on. How I got it was probably just that I was called because someone somewhere thought my work would be appropriate for the film. I think I was hired by the studio, as I recall. 
And I only did just the comprehensive idea. Um, whoever it was, the studio looked at it. They thought it was nice. They wanted one small change. I made the change, and they thought, I thought, because they were interested in making changes, they must be close to the finish. And then, of course, it never happened. They never used it for the movie. And subsequently, after a number of years, I started seeing it on book covers, and it's on the web now everywhere, and it was in magazines. and It was used all over the place. Actually, the original painting I never saw again, it disappeared. So, what was it, three years ago, I, I heard from, from Ridley's office that they were going to use it on his new DVD. I thought, wow, it's a 22-year-old idea. And I went back to the original, kind of looked at the concept and the composition, and then said, what's an improvement? So I used a little different portrait of Harrison, moved things around, but it still has the same look, but it's a little stronger, I think, a little more emotional. I put the rain into it and the, and the neon, and I kept pretty much this color scheme that was in the original, because I liked the dividing the picture down, down the middle and making one half warm and one half cool because that was kind of the movie felt that way. I think I did one more drawing that redesigned it and then painted the picture because I was so anxious to do the thing. Finally, 23 years later, I get to paint a picture for a movie I already love now and know so well. But it took, once I designed it, however long that took, it took about two weeks to paint the picture. But this one I did out of love because it wasn't a commission. I just did it because the situation arose and I just had to do it. Finally, I get to paint the finished painting. So it was a labor of love. So I don't recount exactly how long it took, but that's generally how long most of the paintings take. It's two weeks. Two weeks, 25 years, and three years later. <laughs> that's how long it took. The digital realm has opened up tremendous possibilities in terms of image making and image editing. But it's also given people a chance to screw up and fix it. You didn't have that many chances to screw up and fix it. You had to be pretty straight and narrow and very committed and very careful and very, very thorough and methodical about how it's done, and yet it had to be fresh and artistic. What's well, a hell of a demand? That takes an artist. Uh, all the things that make an artist, from his education to his heart. Um, our job isn't just to imitate nature. It's to bring something more and something more in depth and design and idea and feeling into a picture than just framing nature. So. I mean, I'd like to think that what I do is look into a person's soul, not just frame his, his face. That's a very special kind of creativity. It's also a kind of creativity that's no longer as important as it used to be. Photoshop's marvelous. It's a wonderful, wonderful product. It is a different process. You can cut and paste here without having to go back to, you know, the negative and do that and mix this and retouch that and all that kind of stuff. It's wonderful. At the same time, it eliminated what conventional art always produces, and that is an original. There is no digital original. It's a file. It's a set of binary numbers on a disk somewhere. What happened to the art? Hopefully they'll get over it and realize it's just another tool. But, but it has changed things because now they've put the power of manipulating images into anybody's hands. So now, for the ignorant, they think that that's all there is to it. That's a serious contrast to making a piece of artwork from a blank canvas into something that ultimately becomes a poster that someone wants to buy and collect and have and hold. And so I think it's a pity if the, the posters are losing that, that maybe the, the computer images will get better and they'll be more artful and start to reach people in their hearts again. I very rarely do movie posters anymore because I really, I really don't want to engage the mechanism of marketing and market research. So now as a, as a fine artist with limited editions and originals, I paint pictures about the movies and people seem to love it.